Welcome to the week six lecture for Geography and Tourism Studies TP21. This is Jeff Boggs. As you recall, last week in Spickard, we talked about uh, the content he had in chapter five, which dealt with data collection sites and different kinds of sampling procedures. And you will remember that back in chapter four, or in week four, uh, we covered data collection techniques. You'll likely also remember that once you decide on a particular data collection technique, um, then you will need to know how to select or sample those data. So that is what we covered last week, sampling. This week, we begin to discuss and provide examples of things you can do with your data once you've acquired it. So this week, we will examine some basic methods of analysis. And in particular, we're gonna focus on some really foundational or basic uh, techniques, procedures that are used in quantitative analysis. And by this point, you are probably fairly familiar with Spickard six steps. So the first was develop a good research question. Once you've developed a good research question, so that means that it's specific and it uh, identifies, roughly speaking, what, you, what kind of data you need to collect, at least according to his criteria. You then choose a corresponding logical structure so that structures or organizes how you will go about answering your research question. So that was what we did in this second week of class that corresponds to chapter two. And there were, we learned 10 logical structures according to Spickard. In the third week of class, also corresponding to chapter three of his textbook, we then identify the type of data you need given a particular logical structure and given a particular research question. And according to Spickard, he identifies 14 types of data. Once you've identified the type or types of data that you need, then you work on a data collection method. So this means that you think about how would you get your hot little hands on those data that you need. He identifies 12 data collection techniques or, or methods. And that was in chapter four and chapter five. So last week we talked about choosing a site and a sampling strategy. And here he does not have a ready-made list for us for better or for worse. And this week, we get to talk about his last step. And actually, we'll do that a lot of the rest of the semester. Is we will talk about different data analysis methods and uh, kind of the idiosyncrasies or the intricacies of each of those. So his last step is pick a data analysis method. When you get to this sixth step, you want to ask yourself three preliminary but very important questions before you do anything else. The first question is, what kind of analysis will answer your research question? So hopefully you've thought about this long enough and before you collected your data that the kind of analysis that you have chosen is appropriate for answering your research question. But it's still useful at this point to ask yourself, you know, what kind of analysis, so what techniques or what do I have to do with my data to generate or to produce an answer for my initial research question that sent me off on this wonderful endeavor called research. You then want to confirm or review 
you know, what kind of data do you have exactly? So is it quantitative? Is it qualitative? Are there different types of data that you have? Uh, how do they fit back into the analysis? So do all of the data, do they use the same, are they all being analyzed the same way? Or are you using different kinds of techniques? And then thirdly, you want to be clear on what is your unit of observation and what is your unit of analysis? There, you hear a small stuffy creature in the background. So my kid stayed home from school today. She's got a fever of 100 and uh, she's super stuffy. So you will probably be hearing uh, stuffy sounds in the background. Sorry about that. Anyway, so this third thing you want to be aware of is what is your unit of observation? And is that the same thing as your unit of analysis or not? And we'll go into all of these here in the next couple of slides. Returning to the first of these three questions, so that is, what kind of analysis will answer your research question? You want to realize that if you've been uh, making an honest effort to use Spickard six steps, you've already worked through this to some degree. In particular, you know that the research question that you've developed, in which he talks about research questions really in chapter one, um, those should specify the kind of data that you need. So sometimes, and he, he goes so far as to say that they should be explicit about the kind of data you need. Uh, that, that's useful, especially at your stage, may not always be necessary uh, as long as you implicitly know and can communicate the kind of data that you actually need based on this research question. And this he goes on about in chapter three. But you've also identified a logical structure that would help you answer your research question. And this, you know, he identified 10 different types in chapter two. He goes, he argues that it tells you what you need your data to do. And, you know, sometimes this is to compare, uh, sometimes this is to describe, uh, and there's a, a couple of other words that we might stick in there, but often comparison and description are uh, kind of uh, key or operative words to bear in mind when you're thinking about what your data needs to do to answer your research question. The second question we want to bear in mind as we are deciding on which way to analyze our data or how to analyze our data is to ask ourselves, so what exactly, what kind of data, you know, do we have? So what kind of data do you have once you've collected it? Is it numeric? Generally, uh, this would then involve some kind of quantitative uh, technique. Is it non-numeric? which would be qualitative, and this actually sets up a kind of a poor binary. If someone were, and this is kind of odd coming from Spickard because he strikes me as more of a qualitative researcher as opposed to a quantitative researcher. It's kind of odd that he makes this binary distinction between numeric and non-numeric kinds of data because non-numeric basically just means the absence of any kind of numerical data. Often non-numeric data is, is far more messy and complicated than numeric data, but because it's messy and complicated, can also uh, often will provide more interesting answers than will numeric data. And I say that as someone who uses lots of numeric data. 
Spicker notes that each of these forms allows you to use certain analytical techniques and forbids you from using others. So you want to bear in mind that each technique can only use a particular kind of data. And the really big breakdowns initially are, you know, are these numbers or are these not numbers? And we'll elaborate on those here in the next couple of slides. In this slide, I want to briefly go over a common way of identifying the kinds of numeric data that you have. And then in the slide after this, I'll talk about common kinds of non-numeric data. So numeric data usually is discussed as having one of four levels of measurement. And I use the acronym NOIR, N-O-I-R. Oh, someone's eating a popsicle. You can probably hear the popsicle sounds in the background. All right. So ignore the popsicle sounds, please. So NOIR stands for nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. So that's the French word for black. And I think often a film NOIR is a way to make this more fun. So I'm better able to remember it. So film noir is an old style of both novels and movies. That's often a kind of gritty detective story about the seedy underbelly of the city. And it emerged in the 20, 1920s and the 1930s, but has been sort of modified over the last hundred years. That is, is pretty interesting stuff. But let me come back and talk about noir in this case. So nominal level data corresponds to the N. And nominal is, I believe, Latin for name. It's possible that you know some languages where you've learned about uh, cases in those language languages as there's the nominal or the nominative case. So sort of the, the named case. And nominal, when we talk about numbers, produce our, this is data that is unrankable. So it's things like gender, ethnicity, yes or no sorts of questions or on or off. So that's nominal. So its main point is, is that it is unrankable. So, you know, if you had a list of pets, it might include cats, dogs, ferrets, and in and of themselves, those are unrankable. The names of students on an attendance list, that is another example of nominal data. So it's unrankable, or at least initially it's unrankable. If we think about students' names, we could alphabetize them. And we might think of that as an example then of ordinal data in that there's some underlying system that allows us to rank these data. So ordinal data are rankable. So I suppose students' names ranked in alphabetical order by their last name or their first name or their middle name, that would certainly allow us to rank them. Other examples are things like Likert or Likert scales. So Likert scales tend to have either five or seven points uh, with the middle point uh, being a sort of a, a neutral position. And I think I've got some examples of these later on, but for Likert scales, uh, you've seen these, so, you know, how like an example might be, you know, how do you uh, describe how you degree, how you, sorry, describe how you agree with the following statement? I like dogs. Is it that you strongly disagree? Do you disagree? Do you neither disagree nor agree? Do you agree or do you strongly agree? So that is an example of a Likert scale. And 
so there is a, a ranking that takes place in there based on, in that particular instance, how much you agree or disagree. Pain scales, so if you've ever broken a bone and had to go to the emergency room or you know been hit in the face with a hockey puck or dropped a brick on your foot or lots of other things, doctors or emergency room personnel, paramedics, and ambulances may ask you to rate the pain from zero, or actually they'll usually say one to 10, with the assumption that 10 is perhaps the worst you've ever felt any kind of pain, and one, I suppose, meaning no pain. Though in that case, I would pick a zero, and then it would really be an 11 point scale. But I digress. But these are then examples of uh, ordinal data. Interval level data are rankable, and there are actual, actually equal intervals sort of between the distances on the scale. So whereas on a pain scale, it's really hard to say, you know, is my one the same as your one, or is my one your three, and somebody else's five, actually it's probably would be the reverse, my five would be someone else's three or one, uh, if one is uh, generally no pain, right? Or, but I guess the point there is that we don't really know if, you know, one person's ranking is actually identical to someone else's ranking. Though, again, psychologists will that you who use Likert scales will often pretend that they're interval level data into anyway but we'll ignore that for now so interval level data are rankable and there's equal intervals between each of those ranks and zero is a placeholder so it's not that zero is the absence of something but instead zero is just sort of holds a place. So calendars, or at least years in most calendar systems, operate with zero as a placeholder. So it doesn't mean that there's a lack of time when it's year zero, it just means that's when the calendar starts. And that actually you could have, you know, year negative 25, and that would just be 25 years before the, the, uh, the calendar starts. S uh, perhaps a more common example you're aware of is the difference between centigrade or Fahrenheit. So in both centigrade and Fahrenheit temperature systems, zero degrees centigrade is not identical to zero degrees F, and zero degrees centigrade refers to the point at which water freezes, whereas water freezes under the Fahrenheit system at 32 Fahrenheit. It, in both of these cases, you can still go below zero for quite a ways, and it doesn't mean there's an absence of heat, because that's what temperature measures. Instead, it just means that the temperature is lower than the actual uh, sort of zero point. Often when we think in terms of changes, so that's a delta right there, so that triangle is a delta. When we think in terms of changes, we often uh, will rank these as uh, interval data as well. The last one is ratio level data. Ratio level data is rankable. It also has equal intervals. And zero indicates the absence of whatever is being measured. If we think in terms of, of temperature, Kelvin is another system, sort of degrees Kelvin are uh, so the Kelvin system is another way to measure temperature. 
and zero degrees Kelvin is, I believe, negative 273 Celsius. So at zero degrees Kelvin, there is no heat. That's supposed to be a fairly kind of theoretical point because even if you remove most of the heat from a particular uh, packet of air or atmosphere or vacuum, it's still going to have a slight uh, uh, above zero Kelvin uh, amount of heat because the molecules in it are still going to be moving around and bumping into each other and creating heat. But I digress. Perhaps another form of ratio level data, so data that are numeric and rankable with equal intervals and zeros indicate absence are money. <laughs> so if we think in terms of say Canadian dollars, if I have zero dollars in my bank account, that is not just a placeholder. That means in fact that I have no money in my bank account. And that if I have a hundred dollars in my bank account, that that is twice as much as $50 in my bank account. So one of the things that happens, and I haven't really talked about this too much, is that with equal intervals, that means that you can start to perform sort of uh, more standard mathematical operations. So that for instance, if you know the temperature is 100 degrees Celsius, that's twice as hot as 50 degrees Celsius. All right, so those are then the four levels of measurement. So we have nominal, and it's kind of useful to learn this now because when you go on to take a stats course, part of what you'll have to do is think about what kind of data do I have? So do you have nominal data? Do you have ordinal data? Do you have interval data or do you have ratio level data? So N-O-I-R, noir. So the French word for black. So nominal, ordinal, interval, ratio. And this is useful to know because the way that you analyze nominal data is not the same way that you would analyze ratio level data. So for nominal level data, I can't say that, you know, on its face value, a cat is three times that of a dog, because I don't, there's no sort of, there's no rankable system uh, between cats and dogs, unless, unless you are really particular about it, develop your own system, but there's no sort of natural or apparent system for rank, for, for ranking nominal information or nominal data. Okay, so I'll stop with this one. We also have non-numeric data. And for people that are interested in primarily qualitative research, this is the sort of data they tend to use. So, the first example of non-numeric data is text. Text means a lot of things to lots of different people, but in general, a useful way to think of text is that you know, it can include things like novels, for instance, so a kind of fiction, if we think in terms of literature. You know, advertisements are another kind of text. I've seen lots of students uh, over the years make use of advertisements in both geography and in tourism studies to analyze something, to say something about the places that are being advertised. Graffiti is actually an example of a text. There's then speech. So whereas text is written, speech is spoken. This can include interviews, <coughs> telephone conversations, uh, those are the big ones, I suppose, songs, actually, 
even though songs have lyrics and so they're kind of written. But you can think of those as kinds of non-numeric data. And then the third sort of non-numeric data is visual patterns. This could be art, whether they're photographs or paintings or sculptures, or I suppose, you know, needlework like quilting will often have some kind of image or scene that takes place within the different panels or the single panel in whatever is uh, being knit or whatever the needlework is. Maps have visual patterns uh, and those actually there are ways to to kind of quantitatively analyze some things about maps, but we're not talking about that so much here. Graffiti can also be an example of something that you know produces or is encoded with a visual pattern. So graffiti can be anything from, you know, I love Lucy, you know, spray painted on the side of somebody's fence. The I heart Lucy. And graffiti could also be uh, some sort of nifty little drawing, or I suppose a rude drawing, or lots of other sorts of uh, you know images that have been created with paint, or in some cases chalk, and put on a wall or a sidewalk uh, to produce a visual pattern. So these are examples then of non-numeric data. And these are by no means a complete list of the kinds of non-numeric data that exist. If you're interested in mixed methods research, so mixed methods research will often, will, will by its very nature draw on both quantitative and qualitative data you might find, and, and this is if you're dealing with human beings, so if you're interested in mixed methods research and you're looking at squirrels or, you know, or glacial tilling, that's going to be a, a survey questionnaire isn't going to be appropriate because, you know, glacial till, tills, so the glaciers are not around anymore. And even if they were, they wouldn't fill out a survey questionnaire. Squirrels are also not going to fill out a survey questionnaire. So this works more when you're dealing with people. But survey questionnaires can collect numeric and non-numeric data. That's one of the uh, sort of interesting features of survey questionnaires as a data collection technique. So we could ask, for instance, you know, on a survey questionnaire with four short questions. How many geography or tourism courses have you had in university? And so we'd have a number from maybe zero to 20, though technically, you know, do we mean courses or do we mean half courses? But we'll ignore that for now. We could ask how much did you enjoy that course compared to the other courses or compared to other courses? So here we have a Likert skill. So more than, the same as, a less than. So this is an example of ordinal level data. Maybe we can even write this over here in the margin to help you kind of think about this. Oops, so you go down here, so So that collects that question. Question number two collects ordinal data. Question number one collects ratio level data because the zero means an absence, uh, but there's also uh, kind of equal distances between the values. and it is rankable, right? So if you've had 20 courses in geography or tourism studies, you know, that is clearly more than 19 or 
if I've had zero courses in geography or tourism studies, then that is clearly less than two courses. So question three down here, do you support the abolition of all university fees? Yes, no, no opinion. These are examples of, oh, let me think, it's noir, right, N-O-I-R. It starts with an N, so it's got to be, and it must be nominal. So that is an example of nominal level data being collected. And so these first three are then, we've kind of sorted those into levels of measurement uh, used to describe different kinds of quantitative data. But then if we go on to the fourth question, why is that? So question four is an example of non-numeric data, right? So you know, that's non-numeric data, and it's actually going to be text, right? So here, you know, question three, do you support the abolition of all university fees? That's a, a question that's, you know, yes, no, no opinion. I suppose we could add maybe in there, and then that provides a transition in which you can ask, why is that? So you can then have someone explain why they support or not the abolition of all university fees. And that then is a way, especially, uh, you know, if you asked all three of these questions, or sorry, all four of these questions, you might first be able to discern, you know, of the people that you surveyed, you know, how many had enough courses to be, you know, to have a minor or a major in either geography or tourism studies. And then, you know, did they like those courses more or less than the other courses? And you would hope that if they're a geography or a tourism studies student, that they would generally enjoy their courses in their major more than courses outside of their major. And then we might ask, you know, do you support the abolition of all university fees? So that's a very specific question. And then we ask them to elaborate on that. And so collecting this kind of data then would allow us to see, first of all, uh, do geography or tourism studies students or students who have the characteristics of geography or tourism studies students. That is that they've got enough courses to be a major in one of those majors. Do they tend to support the abolition of all university fees more so or less so than students who are who have had fewer geography or tourism studies courses? And then also we would have, you know, as much as you could say in a hundred words, we would then have like a brief explanation for that. And so with these four questions, we could actually collect a fair amount of data that would allow us to see if geography or tourism studies students, you know, systematically do or do not support the abolition of university fees. It might also let us see, you know, are there students who enjoy geography or tourism studies courses more than other kinds of courses? And if so, you know, do those students support or not support the abolition of university fees? So with this, I would have to think about what is the research question that motivates all of these, because these are not research questions. These are are survey questions. So these are not interview questions. These are survey questions that would then be you know, designed for 
a survey that uh, is used to collect data to answer some larger research question. So, and it, it might be that, you know, do they, do these students, it could be that the research question has something about paying for uh, field courses, right? So I'd have to kind of think about how that would work out. Uh, we'll call this one, we'll stop here on this one. If we step back about probably 15 or 20 minutes in the lecture, you'll recall that there were three different questions that we were asking before or while we were deciding on the method of analysis. This question, what is your unit of observation and unit of analysis? That was the third question that we were asking. before we strolled off down uh, the path of discussing the difference between numeric and non-numeric data. Okay, so if we come to this question, what is your unit of observation and unit of, an, of analysis? What do we mean by that? So the unit of observation is the form or scale in which you initially record your data. So it corresponds roughly to you know, how we initially recorded our data. So it might be that if I'm a physical geographer and I'm interested in analyzing uh, the amount of, I guess, the relation between species diversity in a stream and depth of the stream, one of the things I might do is take water samples so I can then count in each water sample the number of organisms if uh, in that water sample. And, and let's say that in terms of species diversity, we're interested in sort of insects and other smaller microscopic creatures. So what we might do is in a particular stream it is first measure how deep the stream is that is at that point and then at the surface at that same spot you know collect 100 uh, centiliters of actually i guess that would be a liter so collect a liter of water from that stream and then move another meter along the uh, stream, maybe deeper into the stream, measure how deep it is there, and then collect another liter of water. And then I record the location of like on the side of each of those bottles that I, I'm collecting the water in so that I know that, you know, bottle number one was collected maybe right where the shore begins. And I know that the water there was, you know, only two centimeters deep. Actually, probably need to be a little deeper than that to, to fill up a liter. So maybe, you know, 15 centimeters deep and I get a liter of water. And then I repeat that a meter out further into the stream and I go out, you know, some distance until I can no longer measure the bottom of the stream. And each of those samples is a unit of observation. So, and, you know, it's a one liter sample probably contains insects and microscopic organisms in it. And so that's how I've initially collected or recorded my data. And then what I would do with each of those liters of water is uh, look at them, you know, I guess take slides from them and uh, you know, prepare slides to go under a microscope, and then under the microscope count the different the number of different species of microscopic organisms I can see, you know, on my slide, and then maybe also in that liter of water count the number of different species of insects that I can see with my eye. 
All right, so that's an example then of a unit of observation. But then our unit of analysis is the form or the scale in which we analyze our data. So it might be that instead of, you know, that, that maybe we've pre uh, repeated this procedure in five different streams and our unit of analysis is going to be five streams. So it could be that, you know, in one stream we collected, you know, we had 32 units of observation, maybe in another we had 12, and another we had five, and another we had 323, and the last one we had 15, perhaps. So for each of those units of analysis, we have a different number of observations. And it might be that we then, you know, just decide that for each stream, we're just going to, you know, across all of our samples, take the average number of microscopic organisms and the average number of bugs that were found, you know, for each of the, of the, if you look at all of the units of observation from a particular stream. And so there we've kind of, we've scaled up is one way to think of this. Uh, so our unit of analysis isn't, you know, these hundreds of different uh, samples of water, but instead it's the five streams. And the thing to remember about units of observation and units of analysis, so like I had in the previous example where we had water samples and then those water samples were sort of aggregated together to give us an understanding of the stream, that sometimes our units of observation are not the same thing as our units of analysis. So bear that in mind. So the census, the Canadian census, will often provide us information about, you know, a municipality or something smaller, like a dissemination area. And even though in that case, the, the, in the case of the census, the unit of analysis is a household sorry, that's not the unit of analysis. Usually the unit of observation is a household. So a household receives the census and fills out the form. And then sometimes they'll also get the long form survey if they were randomly selected. But in either case, the unit of observation is that household. And when Statistics Canada releases that data, in order to maintain people's uh, confidentiality, they will aggregate that data up to a larger geographic unit. So it's not just about one household, it's about all of the households that are found within this particular location. All right, let's talk about common units of analysis. So we can have individuals. So I'm an individual, you're an individual, that person sitting over there, they're an individual. And, you know, we could think about geese, geese. There's an individual goose, you know, maybe you've caught it and you put a little band around its leg so that you number, know that it's number 293. I mean, you can name it also. You know, Maud might be your name for the goose, uh, but we can think about geese as you know individual geese. We can think about students, so you're all students, so each of you is an individual student. And so we might collect data on individuals and then examine, so our unit of observation could be individuals, but then our unit of analysis could also be individuals. However, we could also select groups or a group or kinds of groups as the unit of analysis. And those may or may not also be the unit of observation. So flocks of geese, it might be that we happen to know in three flocks, we actually know 
all of the geese in each of those flocks. And so we have individual, uh, individual level data on each of those geese in each of those flocks. And then we can aggregate that up to say something about each of those three flocks. Or it might be that we are wildlife uh, biogeographers and we look out the window or actually, you know, we're sitting along the shore and we see geese fly overhead in a V formation heading south for the winter. And we assume that that is counts as a flock of geese. And, you know, we could record, we could take a picture actually, and then record, you know, how many geese are in that formation or in that flock and perhaps how high up are they and in which direction are they flying. And so for that, we don't really need data on the individual geese. Um, we just need it on the whole collection of geese. So that might be a case then where we have, you know, a group, like a, we have collected data at the level of the group and we're analyzing at the level of the group. Student households could be an example as well. Uh, organizations. We might look at individual organizations that all share something in common. So, you know, nonprofits, for instances, or ice cream stands. That's a sort of organization. And we could look at those individually or as groups and collect our data of them as individual organizations or as, you know, in general, as a kind of a, a group that is a particular kind of organization. You know, wildlife conservation organizations are an example here. If we go with the geese example, school boards are another kind of organization that, uh, you know, impacts the lives of students, especially K through 12 students. Geographic units, so quadrants, so basically squares that you've laid out on a particular plot of land or water or provinces. Those are other examples of geographic units. Countries, those could be thought of as geographic units. Social interactions might be the thing that we're analyzing. So migration networks would be one example of this. So often when people migrate, they know someone in the destination where they're going to migrate to. And when they, when that individual migrates to that new location, they also know people that they left in the origin who now know someone in the destination and who can provide information about the destination. And in doing so, alter the likelihood uh, or it, I guess affect the flow of information about uh, the advantages and disadvantages of living in this new migrant destination, right? So, and so these interactions, so they might be things like taking place through phone calls or God forbid somebody writes a letter and puts a stamp on it. Not that anybody does that anymore. Uh, that these kinds of social interactions might be both our unit of observation, but also our unit of analysis. We might also think of things like marriages or divorces as a kind of a social interaction. So with marriages and with divorces, they, those tend to be associated with paperwork and they tend to be uh, paperwork about the either forming or breaking a particular kind of legal arrangement between two people. Uh, but we can think of those also as kind of markers of particular kinds of social interactions around uh, family formation or family dissolution. And so those could be not only the things, so you know, birth certificate, not birth certificates, marriage certificates or, or divorce certificates or documentation about divorces could be 
uh, the kind of data that we are collecting on individuals, and then we could aggregate up from that to say something about marriages or divorces. Artifacts are another common unit of analysis, and artifacts are in this case are things, things you can trip over usually. So they might be buildings, they might be roads, uh, you know, I suppose they can be even things like billboards or wedding rings, shoes, all these kinds of things are examples of artifacts. And so we could collect data on particular, uh, if we were thinking, I guess, of wedding rings, we could collect data on wedding ring sales. So from, you know, as people, as particular couples acquire wedding rings, and then aggregate up from that to say something about wedding rings and what that actually might also tell us about where social interactions take place. But the unit of analysis might then be, you know, for these artifacts that we've collected. So these units of, the, if we think of those as like that's the unit of observation, then we can aggregate up from those to something else. All right, I'm starting to go off into the weeds here. I think that's all for this one. Oh wait, artifacts. Another kind of artifact could be things like texts. So books or newspapers or songs or movies are all examples of artifacts as well. And it could be that you, you know, look at a particular book and maybe that book's a particular, I don't know, science fiction, a particular kind of science fiction, and then you, you know, you've collect a lot of different similar kinds of uh, you know post-apocalyptic science fiction and you decide that you know your research question might have been you know how do science fiction writers imagine a, a sort of a utopias or dystopias and your data that you could use could be particular kinds of science fictional texts where you then even look at them and, you know, how have the way they talk about or the way they frame particular kinds of utopias or dystopias, how has that changed over time? Which actually, there's often a, a geography that underlies all of that as well. So that can be pretty interesting. However, you're probably not gonna do that for Peterborough. So at this point, we're gonna stop talking about units of analysis and kind of ways to categorize units of analysis. And we are, I believe, going to take a break here, and then I will start a new film after this uh, that will follow with an example. Never mind, I was wrong. We're almost done with this segment. The thing that you want to remember is that aggregating up is easier than disaggregating down. So what this means is if you collect individual data, it can be aggregated into a group. So there's a bunch of geese that I happen to know. I have data on all of them, like their date, their date of birth, maybe where they were born, how much they weigh, how much corn they eat on average, you know, over a seven day period. And from that, then I could come up with, you know, here's the minimum amount of corn that they eat. Here's the maximum amount of corn, you know, that's eaten, you know, by these individual geese when we sort of lump them into a group but if all i know is that these geese you know eat on average you know five kilos of corn a week i don't really know you know which i can't from that break it down to say oh well that goose actually eats about 10 kilos of corn a week that would be like 20 pounds or it's more than 20 pounds of corn that is a lot of carbohydrates so I don't know if geese would actually eat that much, but I digress. But anyway, the point is that if all I have is something like an average, I can't go backwards from that and say, oh, well, you know, actually 
that goose only eats this much or that goose eats that much, right? It'd be like if we take the average height, the mean height, if you will, of everybody in a classroom. So we, and, and all we record is actual the average height for everybody in the classroom. We can't then go backwards from that. If we, however, collect individual data and record it and store it, and we know that everybody's, we know everybody's height, we can then aggregate that and from that come up with the average height for the classroom. Yeah, so individual height of each student is an example of individual data. So if we collect group data, it cannot be disaggregated into individual data. So if all you get is the average or the mean height of all students in a classroom, that's all you can really, you can't do anything else with that. So bear that in mind as you're collecting data and as you're saving data that you have collected. At this point, I think we're done with the first phase of the lecture. There will be another one that follows this for week six. Thanks for sticking around.